All right, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. Ephesians 1 verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Let's bow our hearts now in a word of prayer. God and Father, we do thank you for Jesus Christ and for the opportunity of looking to your word and studying together this morning as we do so now. We pray that the things said in God will honor and glorify the name of Christ and will be edifying to the saints. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, uh, we want to continue our study this morning on forgiveness. Last week we talked about the blessing of forgiveness. Um, it is one of the blessings. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 1 here, um, Paul is listing in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And uh, he, so he talks about all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And then he proceeds to list some of those blessings that we have in Christ. And one of those, of course, in verse 7, is that we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So as Paul talks about what, what it means to be redeemed, what it means to have redemption through his blood, he sort of gives us the, the, the definition there. It is the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Um, so as I said, we started to talk about that last week, the blessing of forgiveness. And we'll review just a little bit uh, some of the, the, the basics about forgiveness because it's important. It is, as we said last week, forgiveness is the basic offer and character of grace. Um, if you wanted to take one word that maybe would express, this is what I have as a result of God's grace, it is forgiveness. Forgiveness of the penalty of sin, forgiveness of, of, of that debt that you owed because of sin, forgiveness of all that sin brought um, into this world and into our lives as individuals. God offers us forgiveness of all of those things. Um, so to just kind of set the, the stage for what that means, uh, get Psalm chapter 2. In Acts chapter 26. Psalms chapter 2 and Acts chapter 26. And these two uh, passages we, we looked at last week. And, and we've looked at them before. But they really do set up the contrast between uh, the law and, and the prophetic program and the dispensation of grace and God's attitude toward man being an attitude of forgiveness in this dispensation of grace. Uh, in Psalm chapter 2, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? And of course those two groups of people that we talk about all the time, the heathen, that's the Gentiles out there, and the people, that's the people of Israel, David's people, as he writes the psalm, Verse 2, he iterate, reiterates those two groups of people. The kings of the earth, again, that's the Gentiles, set themselves. And the rulers, that's the nation Israel, the rulers of Israel, take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder uh, uh, and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. So the psalmist writes about a time when the nations of the world, the leaders of the nations, and the rulers of Israel, Israel will be in league with one another in partnership to cast off the bands of the Lord and his anointed. And the response of God will be uh, to laugh, to have them in derision. Verse 5, then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. So at that point, God will speak to them in his wrath. That is, his, his response to mankind's rebellion, his response to the people and to the Gentiles will be to speak to them in his wrath uh, and vex them in his sore displeasure. You get to Acts chapter 26 and Paul is recounting what happened on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9 and of course that time in history when, when, when humanity has reached that crisis point where the kings of the earth and the rulers of Israel have joined together and they've said, we will break the bands asunder of the Lord and his anointed. Uh, it, it comes about at the crucifixion of Christ and then at the persecution of his followers under the power of the Holy Spirit after that, um, kind of culminating in the stoning of Stephen. And the stage is set there in the book of Acts chapter 7 for Psalm chapter 2 to be fulfilled for God to speak in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. And instead, in verse 16 of Acts chapter 26, um, referring to an event that happened back in Acts 9, as, as Christ appeared to him in the road to Damascus, this is what Christ said to Saul, but rise to stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of those things in which, the, which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, 
to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. And you see the difference there, verse 17, the, the people and the Gentiles, the same two groups, the same two groups that are in the book of Psalms that are ready to receive the wrath of God. But in verse 18, those two groups, Paul, Paul is sent to them to open their eyes, to turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness. The first, the first thing that mankind is going to receive as a result of God's grace is forgiveness. They'll receive forgiveness of sin. So unlike the prophetic program, which took those two groups and poured out God's wrath on them, the dispensation of grace takes those two groups and offers them forgiveness. And as Paul begins to preach and proclaim that message in Acts chapter 13, and we've been talking on Wednesday nights about when Paul began to do this and when, when the dispensation of grace and the message of grace and the church, the body of Christ began to be proclaimed. And in Acts chapter 13, if you look at verse 38, be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Verse 38, be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, through Jesus Christ, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins sins. The first issue that Paul gets to, he preaches this long sermon in Antioch of Pisidia uh, about the nation Israel and about their history and about what they did and about how they crucified Christ and about how God raised them up and then the very first issue what does all that mean to you? What all of it means is that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And just as Jesus Christ told him to do on the road to Damascus he begins to preach to the people and to the Gentiles forgiveness of sins. And so forgiveness becomes the, the issue in the dispensation of grace. It becomes the one message um, that Paul, first there's resurrection. We've talked about how important resurrection is uh, to Paul's ministry and message. And we'll, we'll talk about that again in a few weeks here at Easter. Um, but forgiveness, what does that resurrection get you? It gets you forgiveness of sin. Uh, and that forgiveness is something that is a blanket forgiveness. Uh, if you go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, last week we, we just wanted to understand how, how does that forgiveness come? What is the character and the nature of that forgiveness? And the character and nature of that forgiveness is that it is a blanket pardon, if you will. Um, you know, when, when uh, Trump was going out of office, he issued pardons to people, and, and every president does that. They, they, at the end of their term, you know, they, they issue pardons, and it's a, generally a full and complete pardon. That is, whatever the issue is as far as breaking civil law, breaking man's law, they are pardoned. There is no penalty, there is no record of it, there is no anything. It's a pardon. And that's what is given for our, not just for one act or one thing that we were found guilty of, but our sins are forgiven. They are pardoned. They are set aside. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 19, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And we talked last week about the fact that God cannot just go about willy-nilly forgiving sin. He can't just say, well, yeah, I'm going to forgive Herb's sin, I'm going to forgive Mary Jane's sin, just because just I'm a nice guy. There has to be a basis for it. There has to be a reason. There has to be something that allows his justice to be satisfied. And so when God, in the person of Christ, um, did not impute the trespasses unto mankind, unto the world, but instead imputed them unto Christ. And when Christ died, verse, verse 21, he hath made him to be sin for us. And in that process, he is made to be sin. He did not sin, but he is made to be sin. He becomes the personification of sin. He becomes all that sin is on the cross that day. And when he died, he, he died to pay for all those sins so that God could forgive us, but by no means clear the guilty. And he did by no means clear the guilty because Jesus Christ was declared guilty and Jesus Christ was not cleared. In fact, Jesus Christ paid the full and ultimate penalty so that we could have the full and ultimate pardon for our sins and be declared righteous in him. So that's the, the basis of our forgiveness is what Christ did. Uh, it is, the character of our forgiveness is that it's complete and absolute. 
There, there's not one sin. You know, we often say, when Christ died on the cross, every one of your sins, he wasn't dying for anything you had done. He was dying for all stuff that you were going to do. So every one of those sins is paid for. Every one of those sins is covered. Every one of those sins is pardoned. Every one of those sins is forgiven. Everything you ever have done, are doing, or will do uh, is under the blood of Christ. And it's simply a matter now of, of trusting that, believing that, having faith in that, agreeing with God about that. God looks at the blood of Christ and says, it, it takes care of all sin. And we just agree with that, agree with what God says about it. And we have our sins forgiven and in place the righteousness of God. So that's the process and that's what we receive. Um, but we want to talk also about now what's, what's the practical nature. Oh, one thing we didn't get to last week. Um, go over to Colossians chapter 2. We, we, we finished with this verse last week, Colossians chapter 2. Uh, and it, it's, you know, it talks about the forgiveness of trespasses. But there's, there's a, a, a double blessing, if you will. Uh, for us as Gentiles in the dispensation of grace uh, Colossians chapter 2 and verse number um, 13 and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him having forgiven you all trespasses so we are forgiven all trespasses quickened made alive with him but notice what Paul says you are dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. So as Gentiles, Paul writes to these Gentiles at Colossae and he says, you know what, you weren't just dead in your sins, but you were dead in the uncircumcision of your flesh. You weren't just a sinner, you were an uncircumcised sinner. And that's, that's, you know, that's really being on the wrong side of the tracks. So you're born a sinner, all men are born sinners, but you Gentiles, you really didn't have hope. If you go back to Ephesians, and of course Ephesians and Colossians are parallel books, oftentimes in what he, he refers to briefly in Colossians, he'll explain a little more in Ephesians, because it's just a longer book. Ephesians 2.1, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. So that's, we were dead in trespasses and sins, and he quickened us, he made us alive, he forgave us. But down in verse 11, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strange from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. And not only are we dead in trespasses and sins, but also we are dead in the uncircumcision of our flesh, and we had no hope, and we were without God in the world. So not only were you born in trespasses and sins, you had no hope of getting out of those trespasses and sins. You had no hope uh, uh, because you were strangers from the covenants of promise, you were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, only Israel can be blessed, only Israel can be forgiven. Um, so, uh, Isaiah chapter 53 says, for, he, was, he was bruised for our iniquities, Isaiah says. The sins of, of my people, of Isaiah's people. He was wounded for our transgressions. Only Israel. So even the death of Christ, even when he came, it's about Israel and about what God is going to do for that nation to forgive their sin. But it's not till Paul comes along and says, you know what, it's not just for people that are dead in trespasses and sins, but it's for those that are also have no hope and are without God in the world. And in Colossians chapter 2, Paul kind of summarizes that and says, yeah, you were dead in trespasses and sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh. You were twice dead. And God raised the twice dead to sit, sit together with him and forgave us all trespasses. So for us as Gentiles, that forgiveness is is even a little sweeter, even a little more uh, amazing than, than for the nation Israel. So when Paul says, I'm going to two groups, to Israel and to the Gentiles, but even that those Jews that he went to, remember, those Jews have been accounted with the Gentiles. Stephen stood up on, on the day that he is martyred, and he said, uh, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. And he pronounced that nation, those unbelieving Jews, as being 
uncircumcised in heart and ears. You're like the Gentiles. So, so God is offering salvation not just to those Jews that didn't believe, but also to those Gentiles that never believed, that had no opportunity to believe, that without, uh, uh, had no hope, and without God in the world. So that's the offer that's made. And, and the, the, the character of what we get is this complete, unconditional pardon from all sins that we have ever have or will commit. Now, what does that mean to us? So, all right, it means we have forgiveness. But that should color and should affect the way we view everything else based on that forgiveness. The way we view ourselves and the way we view others. Let's go back to the book of Romans chapter 7. Paul has this interesting uh, section in the book of Romans here where he, he, he sort of berates himself but the, in Romans chapter 7 because Romans 7 he's, he's looking at things sort of from a law perspective but then in Romans 8 he, he gets back to the position that we have in Christ. And in Romans 7, uh, let's start at verse 19. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. So Paul kind of talks about the problem that he has there, right? That... Uh, the good that I would, I do not. The evil which I would not, that I do. Um, and then he says, but you know, it's, it's not me, but it's sin that dwelleth in me. But how to perform that which is good, I, you know, I, I know what is good. But how to perform that which is good, I, I don't see. So he sort of um, uh, has a little, uh, mm, a little guilt fest there. Look, look, look at this, look at this. Uh, oh, wretched man that I am. And, and one of the problems that people suffer with today, all of us do at some time or other, or more or less, is, is guilt. Guilt over you know, something that happened in the past, something we did in the past, something that, that we should have done in the past and didn't do in the past, whatever the case might be, we have this guilt. And one of the things that forgiveness does is allow us to set aside guilt. Uh, in fact... Um, uh, well, let's talk about this first, then we'll, we'll look at our thought for the week. So how does Paul do that? Well, in Romans chapter 7, you know, he talks about this war that goes on in his members, and he talks about, oh, wretched man that I am. Uh, but then he gets to chapter 8, and he says this, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Um, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free, from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So Paul says, you know what, though, even though there's this battle inside me, even though I am this wretched man in my flesh, there is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. That we've been made free from the law of sin and death. What the law couldn't do in those weak through the flesh, we have in Christ. The, verse 4, the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us. So Paul's response to, O oh, wretched man that I am, is, but there's no condemnation. And as you go down through the 8th the chapter of Romans here, you get down to verse um, 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? N nobody can. It it's God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? Who can condemn? 
No one can. It is Christ that died rather than is risen again. Paul, Paul is saying, you know what, there, there is no condemnation. I am in the elect. I am justified. I am sanctified. I am seated at the right hand of the Father. That's what Romans 8, 28, 29, and 30 are all about. Um, verse, 29, uh, verse 29, whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Whom he did predestinate, that may also call, whom he called, that may also justify, whom he justified, that may also glorify. All of those things Paul's saying are true. And I will, not, I will not be held hostage to Romans chapter 7, the wretched man that I am, because of Romans chapter 8. Because who loves shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? I will not be hostage to the good that I would I do not, the evil which I not, do not that, that, that do I, because there is no condemnation. Who is he that condemneth? No one can. Including Paul did not condemn himself. Paul didn't, didn't wallow in, in, in guilt. I mean, and, and imagine how much guilt Paul could theoretically have had. Once Paul came to understand, you know, he is, if you look in, in the book of Acts, he is the one that's responsible for the murder of, we don't know how many hundreds, thousands of kingdom saints, and the torture of probably many more. So how, how would you live? And once you come to find out, you know what? Wow, Jesus is the Christ. Wow. How do you live with that guilt? If you had killed thousands of believers just for naming the name of Christ, and now you name the name of Christ, and, and the faith which you once destroyed, you now proclaim. How would you live with that guilt? Well, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. And Paul didn't, didn't wallow in what he was. In fact, if you turn to Philippians chapter 3, in Philippians he has a good, uh, a good uh, little, little encapsulation of this for us to live our lives by. Philippians chapter 3 um, he, he, he names all the things you know, that he was. Verse 5, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. He was very zealous in his persecution of the church. The book of Acts says, hailing men and women, he cast them into prison. And, and, and when, when their lives were taken, when they were martyred, Saul spoke his name, spoke his word against them. When Stephen is murdered, when Stephen is martyred, Saul set his name against him. He gave his, by my authority, these people are going to be killed. And then, so, so, and, and he says all that in, in Philippians 3. Then you get down to verse um, 13. Brother, and I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. And reaching forth unto the things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Forgetting those things which are behind. How do you do that? When, when, you're, when you're Paul, who started out as Saul, and you have that history, how do you forget those things which are behind and reach forth unto the things that are before and press toward the mark for the prize of the high call? I've got a high calling in God now through Jesus Christ. How do I press toward that in light of who I was and what I did? And so Paul, I think, understood something about carrying guilt and carrying regret and carrying sorrow for things past. But his attitude is, I count, uh, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. So Paul viewed himself, he, he, I, I've got to view myself the way God views me. That is, not, O oh, wretched man that I am in the body of this flesh, but there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ. Not the evil that I would not, that I do, and the evil that I, or the good that I would, that I do not. But who is he that condemneth? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And that's what he calls us to do. 
That's, that's the cure. You know, the psychiatrists and psychologists' office are full of people that are there because they feel guilty about something or someone or some, you know, whatever happened in the past. And, and Paul says, here's the answer. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. And then he says, let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. So that's, let us all think this way. Let us all not think about what is behind but what is ahead. Let us press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So that's, that's Paul's attitude about himself. But then he also takes that attitude and applies it to others. If you go to Ephesians chapter 4, and, and it's a verse you all know, but I, I think it really is a verse that is important in our understanding of what does our forgiveness allow us to do. And Ephesians 4.32, Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And before we get too far on with that, um, the, the, the thought for the week, the thoughts actually for the week, two of them in your bulletin, um, are, are about this very issue of forgiveness. Um, in fact, they, they kind of spurred the, the idea in my mind to preach on forgiveness. There, there are two quotes from C.S. Lewis, and the first quote is about what we just talked about, about guilt is forgiving ourselves. C.S. Lewis said this, I think that if God forgives us, we must forgive ourselves. Otherwise, it is almost like setting up ourselves as a higher tribunal than him. And that's a good, you know, that's a really good way to put it. I think if, if God forgives us, then we must forgive ourselves because if God says you're forgiven and we, uh, we say, well, I don't forgive myself, then aren't we setting ourselves up as a higher tribunal than God? Aren't we saying, well, our standards are a little bit higher than God's? Yeah, God could forgive us, but you know, God forgive give me what, whatever it is in the past. What Paul's past, God for, could forgive that, but he couldn't forgive my past. And, you know, I, I, or, or he could forgive my past, but, but I can't forgive it. I can't forget it. I keep dwelling on it. I keep feeling guilty about it. I keep having these twinges of regret about it. No, he, he says, you know what? If God forgives us, then we have to forgive ourselves. Because we can't make our standard of justice. I mean, how foolish is it? You know, we talk about we're in the season now that the religious world calls Lent. And they say, well, I'm going to give up something to, you know, to, because... Christ sacrificed for us, so I'm going to give up something to make myself more holy before God. And we talk about how silly it is to say, I, I can give up something. Me giving up something is going to help the blood of Christ be more sufficient. I'm going to give up something, and that will make God happy with me. The blood of Christ doesn't quite do it. I've got to give up chocolate or whatever, beer or whatever it is you're going to give up. You know, that's what I have to do. Well, you know, the same thing is, is true well, yeah, it's, it, you know, God can forgive me based on the blood of Christ, but I can't, my standards are a little higher than that. My standards are a little higher than God. I can't forgive. I can't forget. I gotta, I'm full of regret. Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind. And C.S. Lewis says it well. I think if God forgives us, we must forgive ourselves. Otherwise, it is almost like setting up ourselves as a higher tribunal than him. And you know what I would say? It is not almost like setting up ourselves as a higher tribunal than him. It is exactly like setting up ourselves as a higher tribunal than him. And we ought not to do that. And then the, the application of that forgiveness to others. We read the verse, Ephesians 4.32. Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And of course, we know that is a marked contrast to the instruction that Christ gave. If you keep your hand here and, and, and just flip back real quickly to Matthew chapter 6 at the end of the so-called Lord's Prayer, uh, where you know, he, he's teaching them to pray, and then in the midst of that prayer in verse 12 of Matthew chapter 6, he says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then at the end of the prayer, verse 14, For if, we, if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. 
And Jesus Christ makes clear, hey, if you want to be forgiven, you need to forgive. And if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. I, you know, so, so, some years ago, I went, drove past a church here in town, and they had, that, they had Matthew 6.14 on their bulletin board out front. You know, if, if you forgive, you'll be forgiven. And I thought, why, why would you want to put that on a bulletin board? Why would you tell people that? Why would you tell people, if you don't forgive, you'll not be forgiven? Because how many of us forgive completely like God does? Every wrong that's ever been done to us. And if that's the standard, guess what? Might as well close up shop now. But Paul gives a new standard. Because remember, Paul's message is not wrath. His message is forgiveness. And his standard now is that you forgive one another even as God for Christ's sake hath, past tense, already done, forgiven you. So that's the new standard. Not forgive so that God will forgive you, but forgive because he already has. You know, and the same thing is true of forgiving yourself. What, what did the law do to the nation Israel? That in those sacrifices there is a remembrance made again of sins every year. Now is that exactly the opposite of what Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind? How could you have remembrance again of sins every year and forget those things which are behind? Isn't the very nature of the law is remember. The very nature of grace is forget. Forget. Yeah, I'm, I'm good at that one. Forget. I'm getting better at it all the time. Forget. So the law says remember your sin. Grace says forget it. Why? Not because it's unimportant or not because it's not serious or not because God doesn't hate it but you forget it because it's forgiven and it's a full and complete pardon so Paul and, and, and if you go back to, to uh, Ephesians 4 this is part of this section of Ephesians where Paul's saying you put off this and you put on this in verse 22 um, that she put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So put off the old man, all that is in Adam, put on the new man, all that you are in Christ. And, and then he gives illustrations of that, verse 25. Wherefore putting away lying... So if you're going to put away lying, what would you replace lying with? The truth. And that's what he says. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. So it's, it's, it's that way all down through the rest of the chapter. You put this off, and the opposite of that you put on. And it's interesting in verse 31, because I think you've got to read verse 31 with verse 32. Verse 31 be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. That's what she put on. What is it that that's replacing? What is the kindness, tender-hearted, forgiving, replacing? It's replacing, verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. That's what you put, and in fact, you see the words in there, you put away wrath and put on forgiveness. Exactly what did God do dispensationally did we, when we started? He put away the wrath, Psalm chapter 2, and he put on forgiveness, Acts chapter 26. And now he says to us, do, <laughs> do what I did. Put away the wrath, put away bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, and malice. Put that all away and replace it with forgiveness. Because if you, if you hold, if you are unforgiving, it's going to cause you to be bitter. If you're, if you're bitter, I, I guarantee it's because you're unforgiving. There's something somewhere along the line, you just can't forgive it, you can't get over it, you can't get past it, and it makes you bitter. And it makes you angry. And it makes you speak evil of others. And it makes you have malice because I'm going to get them someday. 
you know, there's a there's a, a, a line from a Star Trek movie, which you know, you, all the good lines come. Star Trek and Godfather. You can't preach without those two. And and the Klingons have an old saying: "Revenge is a dish best served cold." And what's the idea of that? Well, the idea of that is, yeah, if you wrong me, I'm I may not get you back today, I may not get you back tomorrow, but someday I'll get you back. And it's best when it's served cold because if I get you back 30 years from now, nobody's going to tie the two together. Revenge is a dish best served cold. But Paul says revenge is a dish best not served. <laughs> it's best just to put away malice and anger and clamor and evil speaking and bitterness and replace it with tender-hearted kindness, forgiving one another. So deal with others as God has dealt with you. That's the idea. Um, uh, it, uh, Philippians, Philippians chapter two. Philippians chapter two. In fact, uh, before you go, go ahead and get Philippians. We get Galatians also. Galatians chapter six. And that that idea of 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 not having angerness and bitter, but kindness and tender heartedness. Um, Galatians chapter six and verse ten. He kind of even gives us a, a pattern for that. Galatians 6.10 um, as, as ye have therefore opportunity let us do, as we therefore have opportunity let us do good unto all men especially them who are of the household of faith. Let us do good to all men especially especially those of the household of faith because they are forgiven as we are forgiven in Christ. And they are brothers and sisters in Christ. So especially do good, do good to all men. But especially as you have opportunity, do good to those who are the household of faith. Go to Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul encapsulates this thing of, of the, the tenderness and the kindness that leads to forgiving. And he says in Philippians 2, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy. That you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. That's a lot like Ephesians chapter 4. Put away malice and bitterness and clamor and wrath and, and be kind and tender-hearted. It's, it's hard to have malice and bitterness against someone that you esteem more highly than yourself. On the other hand, someone that you're looking down on, it's easy to, you know, to have bitterness or wrath or anger or malice or whatever toward them. But it's very hard if you're esteeming others better than yourself. And if you're not looking on your own things but on things of others, it's very hard to look on the things of others with bitterness and wrath if that's your priority. Be ye kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And where does all that come from here in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5? Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. It's the mind of Christ. As that mind of Christ operates in you, then you view yourself as God views you, and you can view others as God views them. And that's really the key. And C.S. Lewis says it here about the, that second group, others. He says, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable, because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. So, what we did, we, you know, inexcusable. Paul says in Romans chapter 5, we were a, uh, when we were aliens and enemies of God by evil works, we were, we were alienated and enemies of God. And when we were enemies, what did Christ do? Died for us. When we were without strength, when we had no hope, when we were enemies of God, Christ died. When we were inexcusable, Christ died. Well, I'll, I'll forgive this. When, when they come and say they're sorry and do penance and you know all that kind of stuff. No, that's, that's not... <laughs> when Christ died for you, you weren't even here <laughs> to say anything. So, 
You let this mind be in which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought not probably to be equal with God, but made himself from reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, made in the likeness of men, being found as fashion of man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. When that mind is in you, that's a mind of kindness, tender-hearted, forgiving, not just for the sake of forgiving, for Jesus' sake. Because if you just if you just forgive which if you do it without Christ it's not going to be real forgiveness anyhow but if you, you just forgive human forgiveness who, who gets the credit for that? Hmm? You do. Herb does. Yeah, Herb says, I do. Oh, I'm a good guy. You know, I have every right to be mad at you and I have every right to take vengeance on you and I have every right to do this and every right to do that but I'm going to be the bigger man and I'm going to forgive you. Who, who, who gets the honor for that? Who gets the credit for that? I do. I do. But if I forgive you for Christ's sake, who gets the credit for that? Christ does. So you don't forgive somebody because you're such a good person. You forgive somebody because Christ died for them. And then he gets the honor, and he gets the glory, and he gets the praise. And that's real forgiveness. The other one is just human forgiveness, and that's not worth much. But forgiveness because Christ died. Forgiving one another as God for Christ's sake. Why did God forgive you? Even, even though he is a great guy, could he just forgive you? Could he just say, I'm just going to decide to forgive you? He couldn't do that, could he? He will by no means clear the guilty. He can only forgive you based on what Christ did. And who's that give glory to? To Christ. In fact, you read the verse here, um, verse 10, at the end of the, the little passage in Philippians 2, that at the name of verse 9, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Father says, you know what? At the name God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. And, and what you want to do is exalt Christ. Because when you exalt Christ, then who gets exalted? Verse 11. That every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So if you, exalt, if you forgive for Christ's sake, then it exalts Christ, which exalts the Father. If you forgive because you're such a great person, that's the end of it. <laughs> and, and really, you never will forgive just because you're a great person. You can only forgive fully and completely if you forgive for Christ's sake. Because that sin, whatever it is, however bad it is, however rotten it was, however miserably they treated you, that Jesus Christ died to pay for that very sin. And for his sake, I'll forgive it. Whether it's in me or whether it's in somebody else, I'll forgive because he does. Let's bow our hearts now in a word of prayer. God and Father, we do thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that in him we have complete absolute forgiveness and we pray that that will color and guide the way we view ourselves and view others in this life for whom Christ died for it's in his name that we pray amen all right let's all stand let's sing he is